phrase in the bracha that ends in the words la asok bedivrei Torah. It's a way for us to sanctify that which we're going to study together. And so it's the same blessing up to Vitzivanu, then you add la asok bedivrei Torah to engage in the words of Torah, study, worship. So Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher kichanu mitzvotav mitivanu la'asok divrei Torah. So welcome again, and I hope you've had some time to process through and think a bit about our meeting two weeks ago and our conversation about the origins of Christianity and the idea of messiahship. And what I'd like to bring you back to has to do with the concept. <clears throat> of supersessionism, which is very clearly at the core of a whole host of historical realities that begin with Christianity in its claim that Judaism has now been replaced, that Judaism has been concluded, fulfilled, over, and that Christianity has taken its place. When we were together two weeks ago, I mentioned to you the concept known as eschatology, which talks about the end of the world. And that apocalypse is one, form, is one form of eschatology, which talks about this violent upheaval of the earth. And just to remind you again, during this first century period, there was a significant feeling because of the harshness and the power of the Romans in their conquering of the land of Israel, that the world truly was coming to an end. And that was in parallel to the concept within the Christian community that the world was overwhelmed and drowning in sin. And it created a model which I refer to as their process of sin management, which claimed that it was through the expiational sacrificial death of Jesus that one was able to move beyond the sin which they were overwhelmed by. I mentioned last time the concept of original sin which is foreign to Judaism and foreign to Islam. But it is part of the process created within the format of Christianity that gives greater meaning and purpose to the death and resurrection, which is claimed of Jesus. They perceive the story of the Garden of Eden as the origin of this human blight that if some of you recall during the colonial time period in the United States, the schools such as they were had things that were known as horn books. They're basically paddles where they wrote things on them and children learned either to read or to memorize the idea. One of them said, in Adam's sin, we, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. It was very much in the central core model that they saw that story as the creation of a human biological sinfulness that was genetically passed from generation to generation until one could be saved through the belief and the commitment to Jesus. It's kind of important because it's part of this ideology that claims that Judaism had failed. The earth was, the world was coming to an end. Judaism was no longer capable of providing the answers and only Christianity could actually do it. Now, just to belabor this point for another moment, I wanna bring another thought for you to ponder. And that is the world clearly did not come to an end. And if you kind of follow through the history of the past 2000 years, there have been moments where there were people who truly believed the world was coming to an end and they got rid of their possessions. There was an example in 1648, remember Y2K? There were those who believed that in the year 2000, the world was coming to a conclusion. Well, that was very much a part of the ideology of many at the time of 
the first century. But what transpired, and I think it's kind of intriguing, I mentioned it to you last time, in the way in which Paul tried to answer the question by creating the concept of the second coming, that the idea would be that this was the first time this was the kingdom of heaven, the second time would be the kingdom on earth, which of course was equally foreign to Jewish ears and minds about that time period. But what I wanna to present to you is that in many ways, the way in which Pauline Christianity evolved was what I refer to as internalized apocalypse, internalized eschatology, that it was really through the internalization of Jesus and that internal transformation that the world transformed and became something else. Now, in some cases, modern evangelical Christianity is very much enamored of this idea of being born again. Similar kind of idea. I have a good friend who was originally Episcopalian who became a born again Christian and then ultimately called me up and said, I just can't do this anymore. It's exhausting to being born again all the time. I'm going back to the Episcopal Church. Okay. What we're going to look at tonight is to kind of see the evolution of some of these ideas and looking at text within Jewish experience and then moving on into the tenets and experiences of Islam and its creation. So... Ellen, if you could please put um, on the uh, on the screen the text piece so what, that everybody can see. Do you want the Torah or Islam? The, the Torah piece. Okay, I'm going to... All right, we're going to look at a group of texts, and I'm going to walk you through the Kotak perception of the way in which Judaism comes to create itself in the first 12 chapters of... Genesis. So this is a passage which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It is the description of the creation of human beings in the first chapter of Genesis. And look at the direction that is given, that the human being would have rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the earth, and everything that creeps on the earth. And we were created male and female, a very different story than became the dominant story from the next chapter of Genesis, which is the elaborate piece that seems to be championed historically as a description of somehow women were subservient to men. It's not here. The idea that somehow it was Adam's rib that created women. Both stories exist. So now we have in verse 28, the instruction to human beings. So Rabbi, you just let me know when you want me to change screen. I, I'm, I'm good, I'm good for now. Okay. I'll tell you, be fruitful and increase. Okay, so the first mitzvah, the first commandment in the Bible is the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, master it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and the living things that creep. If you wanna go up, it's a little bit. Oh, it's the next screen. Okay. So on earth. on earth. Okay. That is the direction that comes out of the initial story of creation. Let's go to the next text. So that world comes to be challenged in Genesis 6. Uh, the earth was great with man's wickedness. Every plan that the man, the man committed was evil. God regretted that he'd made human beings. And God says, I'm going to blot out from the earth man who I created. And bingo, we've got the story of Noah. And go on to the next text. At the conclusion, we now have a response after the flood. Never again will I doom the earth because of man, since the devising of man's mind are evil from his youth nor will I ever again destroy ever living being as I've done. There was a sacrifice, God liked the smell. Never again will I doom the earth because of man, since the devising of man's mind are evil. Da 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 da. 
So the earth isn't going to get destroyed again. Go on to the next text, if you would. So at the conclusion, God blesses Noah and says to them, oh, look at that. Be fruitful, increase, fill the earth. The same line that you saw in Genesis 1 in terms of the initial instruction to whatever human beings were created at first. But now there are some added directions. Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man's blood shall his blood be shed, because you're built in the image of God. Be fruitful, increase, abound on the earth. And God said, I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring to come and with every living thing that is with you, birds, cattle, da 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 and all that have come out of the ark. I will maintain my covenant with you, a second covenant. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, just to look at that, what that is a statement of is that at this point, the way in which those who either wrote this or interpret this have separated out the idea that there is total control of nature. What this text is saying is that yes, there is a God that creates, but there is a randomness in the earth that is known as weather, and it is not necessarily a means of punishment that God uses when he sees or she sees some form of injustice. You know that when Katrina hit New Orleans, there were those within the Christian community who said the reason this happened is because there are gay people in New Orleans. There are those who still today, when an earthquake takes place, will believe that this is God who is doing this. The story of Noah really claims that that's no longer reality. The other thing that comes out of the Noah story is that there is interpretation that there are Noahide laws that are presented. You don't eat a living animal. You don't kill another human being. That there be courts to resolve things. There are seven of these laws that are perceived to have come out of the experience of Noah. What I want you to start to realize is the evolution from the initial instruction to human beings, which is basically be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth, have dominion over the birds and the land. And now all of a sudden in the Noah conclusion, we have the description of certain kinds of generic humanistic rules for human beings. Let's go on to the next text. Some of you, I hope, are familiar with this story. It's the story of what's known as the Tower of Babel. And it begins by the statement that everybody on Earth spoke one language. And look what they did, even though they could communicate with each other. Let's build bricks and let's build a city and let's build a tower with its top in the sky to make a name for ourselves, else we shall be scattered all over the earth, all over the world. Now, I want you to think very carefully about the imagery of this. We have human beings, all who speak exactly the same language according to this text, and they use their ability to communicate, not for the benefit of their world, but to assail what world? The heavens. To basically replace the concept of God by their humanity building this ladder up to the heavens, this tower. And the result is, and you see it in the next verses, if as one people with one language for all, this is how they have begun to act, then nothing that they may propose to do will be out of their reach. 
Let us then go down and confound their speech so that they shall not understand one another. Now, there are different ways of interpreting this. It's possible that this chapter, chapter 11, is a rationale about why people speak different languages. But, and the way that I interpret most of these texts that we've looked at is that they proceed from the conclusion, not from the linear text, so that the end result is really the point of what they are trying to reinforce. So here we have everybody, according to this story, speaking the same language. And once again, to repeat myself, they're not using that for the common good. They're using it to basically replace the idea of God. Let's look at the next text. One second. It's fine. You're doing great. Uh, okay. What's critical to understand is that with Genesis chapter 12, we begin the history of the Jewish people. There are no Jews before this. The first 11 chapters are stories that are common to the ancient Near East. In many cases, they occur in other settings. There is another flood story. It's known as the Utnapushtim story. There is the Gilgamesh epic, which talks about creation. The difference is, is that these stories, which have parallels in the ancient Near East, have a twist to them and a different kind of answer. And just to point out for a second, in the Gilgamesh epic, the creation of the earth is because gods are struggling with each other, multiple gods, and as a result, by accident, the world gets created. In the story of Genesis, the answer to creation is kitov, it is good, a very different, different message about the role and the importance of creation. So here with chapter 12, we now begin Jewish history with the first Jews, Abram and Sarai. And it needs to be understood very clearly, Abram and Sarai were not born as Jews. They chose to be Jewish. And it is for that reason that anyone who joins our community through history is given the, a new a Hebrew name, but they are also considered to be the spiritual son or daughter of Abraham and Sarah. It's important for us to always, always remember this, because in some cases, Jews have taken on the idea which is really the byproduct of what I taught you last time, one of the outcomes of the Council of Nicaea in 325, which said the Jews were no longer able to welcome people into our community. And over the next 1600 years, what came to be was this perception that was out of our own lack of power to kind of feel like we don't want anybody, we don't need anybody, we're okay. And on the other side of the coin, the, the Christian majority basically said, oh, they're so clannish, they're by themselves. You really can't be part of them. You weren't born into that community. And it's one of the real fallacies of Jewish identity that we still struggle with today. So when you look at this passage, we have in these three verses some of the most important instruction that comes from it. So Abram is told to leave his native land and to follow God. And as a result, God will bless him and make his name great. And he will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Well, let me now unravel the mystery here. The way that I see this is a progression. 
God initially starts off with the creation of human beings and deals with the totality of human life in a very laissez-faire way. Be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth, have dominion over the, the birds, the sea, the land. It's all yours. It doesn't work out. What happens is the earth fills up with violence. We have the flood. God pushes the reset button. After that, with a certain learning curve, God now provides levels of humanistic, generalized instruction. Don't kill another person, have a court, don't eat live animals, the no hide laws. Well, they don't seem to be functioning either because all of a sudden we're shown the Tower of Babel that people are really free range and looking to overtake God in God's setting as the creator. And then we come to Abram, which kind of says, I'm kind of giving up trying to instruct the whole human race. What I'm gonna do rather is I'm gonna select a unique group of individuals, the Jewish people, who by their behavior, by their actions, by their following my path, will be models for others. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. We will be an instructive model, kind of like a family therapeutic behavior, because we will act ethically, because we will acknowledge God's presence, because we will act in certain ways. We will then have the opportunity according to God's perception here, of influencing other groups and other individuals. Moving further into the Torah, when you get to Exodus 20 and you have the description of the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the rabbis dealing with a very different environment that they're living in and in somewhat uncomfortable with the way that Christianity has built this negative reality concerning the Jewish people being God's chosen people, even though, as I said to you the last time, the Christian community believes that God has rejected the Jews because we rejected Jesus and that they are now the new chosen. Nonetheless, the rabbis of the Midrash try and temper the idea of Torah with some very fascinating writings. For example, in, the, in one of the Midrashim, they say, well, you know, God went to other people to offer the Torah to them before it came part of the Jewish people. Really? How did that work out? Well, they went to one particular group of people and the people said, well, what's in the, the Torah? What's in the thing, in the commandments? It says you don't commit adultery. They said, oh, forget that. We committed, adultery is part of the way in which we live. Then they went to other people and they said, what's in it? You shall not steal. Oh, no, 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 no. We're robbers. We like robbing. You can see the model that's created. There's another Midrash that says God held Mount Sinai over the heads of the people there basically forcing them into accepting the Torah. The whole purpose of that is to reduce this presumption, the negative presumption that somehow uh, the Jewish people, even though they believe it's been rejected, still holds some special place. Okay. I hope this makes some sense to you because what we're gonna see is the jump from this idea to the way in which Christianity in the first century basically says Judaism has failed and now Christianity has taken over where it ended and is now the new chosen people, the new covenant, the new community. Now, 
why am I building this? And hopefully you've seen the evolution out of these texts of the way in which I believe it comes to us and reinforces our role and responsibility. Because the same thing happens again with the beginnings of Islam. So if you can go over to the next set of slides. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ellen. Yep. Uh, hold on. Share screen. There we are. Can you see it? Yes. Good. Okay, so as everybody is seeing this, you can kind of read through. Mm -hmm. And you could see that Islam begins around the year 610 with Muhammad at the age of 40. Now, what needs to be said is that Muhammad initially tried to offer his ideas and philosophy to the Jewish community that was living in the Arabian Peninsula, except they said, no, thank you, we've got our own path. As a result, Muhammad didn't necessarily take kindly to that rejection and was not the greatest supporter of Jews and by extension, Christians. Just so that I can reinforce an idea, when we talked about sin earlier and the idea that in Judaism, sin is merely missing the mark, the same thing is true about the way Islam sees sin. It does not see it as a human stain. It sees it as a missed act, very similar to the way we do. Okay, the next slide, please. So here's a little bit of a timeline and you can see the evolution of Islam after Muhammad dies. And what we see here as we move forward 30, 40 years after his death, we basically can understand the evolution of what's known as Sunni and Shia Islam. It has to do with who is the rightful successor to Muhammad. Muhammad never created his own successor line. And what happened is different families believed one or the other was the rightful heir. And that is the distinction initially between the Shia and the Sunni Muslims. The next one, please. Okay, so here is one from actually the very beginning. Uh, and if you look at 661, Ali is assassinated. And as a result, we have the breaks in the family. But you can see Islam is very clear in terms of its military might and the way in which it brings into focus the way in which it brings its ideology. If one is to step back and think about the model of governance for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Judaism, though it talked about kings in the book of Deuteronomy and certainly had its uh, history of kings during our, in the, the time, the before the common era from Solomon on down, from, excuse me, from Saul on down, we had some good ones, we had some bad ones, we had a lot of bad ones. Uh, but after that time period, we've not had a lot of independent time of our own governance and not to use the current chaos in the state of Israel as an example, because that's really the, the byproduct of us having adopted the parliamentary system of government, which is creating enormous havoc currently in the state of Israel, because you can't put a government together because nobody has a majority party. Nonetheless, Judaism has had a not clear view 
of what really is the role of government and autonomy. Christianity, when it became part of the Roman Empire, tried to make a dual leadership model known as Caesaro Papism, where they kind of integrated power and the Pope into the way in which it was. And the, the line that many of you remember from your own Western civilization classes, it has to do with the concept of the Holy Roman Empire, that it really wasn't holy, it really wasn't Roman, but it certainly was an empire. So Christianity also didn't have the most extreme perception of how to govern, even though it governed all the way up until the emancipation in the 19th century with the divine right of kings. The only religion that is clear and direct about what is the role of government is Islam. And it is very simply, the only role of government is to enforce Sharia, Islamic law, that's it. And they're very clear and honest about it. And you can see that the way it has taken shape in many current Islamic countries. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, some more timelines. And you can see the evolution of Islam across North Africa by military conquest. Uh, the beginning of the Crusades, the great struggle between Islam and Christianity for ownership basically of the world. Uh, years ago, I was invited to the Vatican and spent two weeks inside the Vatican and had an opportunity to meet with many of the Cardinals. And I remember meeting with Cardinal Lorenzi, who was from Africa, who was very clear in that the struggle in Africa was between the Catholic Church and the Muslims. That was the struggle. Just so that everybody is very clear and aware, even though it's a side topic, the dominant Africans that were brought here in slaves to the United States during the four, during the, the years of slavery were dominantly Muslim. And most Americans are not aware of that because they see them as kind of being um, Christian. They became really Christian out of their experience here in the United States. There's a very good book written by Gates called The History of the Black Church. And there actually was a show series on PBS that's worth watching because it'll reinforce that. But the struggle between Christianity and Islam is as real today as it was during the time of the Crusades. There are 2.2 billion Christians in the world and probably 1.9 billion Muslims in the world today. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, there you go. I have my own words here. 30% of Africans forced into slavery in the United States are Muslim. So we see this Muslim migration to the United States and then the exclusion of Muslims coming to the United States. What's kind of interesting is that most people are aware of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which is used as the pivot point for the creation of World War I. What one needs to also reinforce is that the guy who killed him was a Muslim and it had to do with the inherent hatred between those two realities. World War I ends with the defeat and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, the last of the great Islamic empire with the creation of the new ones. And then the creation of the state of Israel creates the current struggle between Islam, Judaism, and the world. Take a look at the next one, please. Okay, I think I'm repeating myself here. Go to the next one, please. Okay. 
this goes back to the idea of who would be the follower of the prophet. And if you read this, you can see that he never clearly claimed who would be his successor. The Sunni majority won out and chose Muhammad's close friend, Abu Bakr, to become the first caliph or leader. All eventually became, <clears throat> Ali eventually became the fourth caliph or imam, as Shiites call their rulers. Ali was killed in 1661 as the bitter struggle between Sunni and Shia continued, and it continues to this day. Next chart, please. Oh my gosh, I don't think you can read that. Can you see that at all? My oh my, I'm sorry. I should have done something better. What, what that does is it tries to show the distinction and the volume. 90% of Muslims today are Sunnis, 10% are Shiite. Most Shiites are in Iran, Iraq, and Yemen. We have the issue of who is going to be the leader. I'm so sorry that this isn't darker. You know what, go to the next one. Maybe that'll be better. Okay. Yes. Okay. These numbers are off. They're much bigger today. Okay, so Islam has its own concept of messiahship. And for the Shia, they see it as some kind of a hidden idea. And if you recall in Judaism, there's a concept known as the Lamed Vav Tzadikim, that there are 36 hidden saints, righteous people upon whom the world exists. The idea is somewhat similar in the Islamic perception of how the world works. The Sunni group says that that messianic character will come sometime in the future. Um, can you go up on that page? Is there more there or not? Let's see. No, that's it. That's Wait. it. Okay. In the Shia community, they still practice temporary marriages, not allowed in the Sunni. Uh, both groups pray five times a day. Let's go on to the next. Okay. You can see from this chart, the concentration and the breakdown of which groups are where. And it creates the conflict internally between the various groups themselves. Their issue has to do not only with certain ritual practices, which are in some cases very minor, it has to do with who is the legitimate heir to Muhammad. You wanna go on to the next one? Is there another one? I don't there? think there, I think 10 is it. Okay, all right. So, so I'll, I'll stop, can I stop sharing? Yes, you can, thank you. Okay. So we'll go back okay. to you. I'm gonna, I have some notes that I wanna to read to you. When Muhammad was challenged by his opponents to produce evidence for the existence of Allah, their idea of God, he cited the Jewish and Christian prophets and that preceded him, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Jesus is acknowledged only as a prophet. By Muhammad told those of Mecca that Allah, Allah had sent 
the same messages earlier to Jews and Christians, and Allah was the same God for all, okay? Remember that Judaism teaches that there is only the one God and that Islam and Christianity are not false religions, but are pathways for others to get to the one God. Now, I've said to you, and I need to say it again, that is not necessarily the way that various forms of Christianity through the centuries have either viewed Judaism or Islam. If you recall, when Pope Benedict was still in office, he got into a big, big controversy because he publicly stated, which was known privately, that the church does not recognize the validity of Islam. The church, the Catholic church, really doesn't acknowledge any of the Protestant breakoffs as being legitimate either. Their statement is there is no salvation outside the church. Now that is only in recent decades changed in terms of Jews and Judaism. But Islam followed that pattern also. When we looked at Genesis 12, one of the pieces that I want you to carry away with you and hold really deep in your hearts is the fact that Judaism is exclusively open. It is open to anyone who wants to choose to be Jewish, but once they make that commitment, there are exclusive responsibilities that come with it. Christianity, though it is open to anyone, only provides its benefits to those who have walked into the gate and accepted Jesus. Everyone else is not saved. Islam, also claims a level of superiority over Christianity and Islam. Some years ago, when diplomatic relations were created between Egypt and Israel, I was fortunate to be able to be in Tel Aviv at what was then the apartment of the newly, the newly arrived Egyptian ambassador to Israel. And I remember speaking with him and saying, how is it for you to be here in Israel? It must be quite remarkable. And he said to me without absolutely blinking an eye, well, you know, Musa was a Muslim. Musa is Moshe, okay? Moses, remember Moses? In their view, Moses was a Muslim. He wasn't a Jew. And what I'm trying to develop for you goes back to the text that we looked at. Judaism sees itself in chapter 12 as the new soul pathway for full and complete existence. Christianity comes on the scene and says Judaism's failed and we are the new pathway and the only path, exclusive to everyone and excluding everyone else. Islam comes on the scene and says, well, you know, Jews and Christians, you were prophets, but we have the, the better, we're, we're better than you are. And you as Jews and Christians are placed into a second class status known as a dhimmi. I don't know if any of you ever heard that terminology before. Part of the conflict that exists in Israel today is the fact that there are significant population of Muslims who live under Jewish rule, even though it is a democracy. It's to be in their perception, the opposite. And as a result, it is unacceptable. The Dimi had reduced rights in terms of ownership, in terms of even riding on a horse. Some of you may remember from Purim when we make a lot of fun and joke around that song, look who's leading 
Mordecai's leading Haman, right? Haman's leading Mordecai, come out and see. And Mordecai's on top of a horse. Well, that was a statement that had to do, if you understood Islamic culture, Jews weren't allowed to ride on horses. Only the Muslim could do that. So let me read to you from the Quran which is a, if any of you have ever tried to read it, it's, I think, perhaps uh, an understatement would be to say that it's confusing. It's, it's all over the place. All right. For I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear, hear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear, shall he speak. To Muslims, this passage from the Gospel of John heralds the coming of Muhammad. In the Quran, we read that Jesus said, children of Israel, I am sent to you by God, confirming the Torah that came before you and bringing good news as a messenger to follow me, whose name shall be blessed. And that's in Surah 61 of the gospel. So what am I trying to bring to you? Okay. Within the Islamic community, early attitudes of seeming tolerance and even appreciation of Christians and Jews soon gave way to more narrow interpretations in the Quran and Islamic law, resulting in growing intolerance from the, be from the beginning of Christianity. Christians were nervous about the growth of a new religion that they saw as a Christian heresy and which invaded and took over many of their lands. Again, another section for the Quran. People of the book, do not go to excess in your religion. Say nothing that the truth about God, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only the messenger of God and his word which he cast unto Mary and a spirit from him. So they, so have faith in God and his messenger. Do not say three. It is better that you say God is only one God. He is too glorious to have a son. Everything in the heavens and in the earth belongs to him. God suffices as a guardian. The Messiah would never disdain to be a servant of God, nor would the angels near to him. The Quran says, Iman, Islam accuses Christians and Jews of having corrupted the divine revelations they had received from God. And again, we are a successor, we are a replacement, we are better than that which came before. Islam also rejects the divinity of Jesus and rejects the Trinity as a form of heresy or creating associations to Allah. Also, Islam denies the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, though it accepts the virgin birth and the miracles. Islam teaches that Jesus <coughs> was uplifted alive to heaven. What does that sound like? How about Elijah? Remember Elijah, the prophet, ascends heaven in a fiery chariot? Parallels. In return for submission and the payment of the tax, the dimmy tax, the poll tax, Islam guaranteed the people of the book security of life and protection in the exercise of their religions. Dimmies had 
limited authority under the leadership of their religious chiefs. So what I want you to realize is that the Dimi defines how Christians and Jews are viewed and perceived in the, Christ, in the Arab world. Dimmies were also fair, this is also fun, were also forced to wear distinctive clothing. In the ninth century forever, for instance, <clears throat> the Baghdadi Caliph designated a yellow badge for Jews to wear. Sound familiar? Next week, when we get together and talk about anti-Semitism, we're going to see parallels between that which was done by the Islamic community, dominantly the Christian community, and how it morphed into the way in which the Nazis developed the Nuremberg laws and following in the way in which they viewed and perceived Jews. So I'm gonna take another minute and then I'm gonna open up to whatever it is that you might wanna comment on. Islam as a faith is clearly very powerful and has been. There were times when Jews lived with relative security. Certainly we, um, we long back to the days of the golden age of Spain when Jews lived under the Moors who were the Muslims. I'm not sure it was as great as some people might perceive, but it was certainly better than the way in which Jews lived under Christian rule. Um, Jews in Arab lands in the modern times have not had very welcoming experiences. Uh, and we know that we have transported millions of Jews out of Arab lands in the Middle East to the land of Israel since the Yemeni Jews came in 1954 with Operation Magic Carpet. They came because their lives were really in danger in those countries. Now, prior to the Shah's death in Iran, Jews had very wonderful lives. They were wealthy for the most part, and they lived in a fairly open way. We should also remember that the United States military had tons of bases in Iran prior to the rise of the Shah. The struggle today is not dissimilar from that over the course of the past 2000 years in terms of who's in charge and who makes the rules. One of the great sadnesses for myself and I think for others has been the role of Christian missionaries in the Middle East who have tried to play up to Arab lands at the expense of their relationship with or concern for Jews in the land of Israel. They, in many cases, gave up that in order to protect themselves. In Bethlehem, if any of you have been there, there is a university that was founded by the Vatican in the early 60s. And its goal was to maintain a Christian population in Bethlehem. It hasn't happened. You know, uh, Arab Christians in many cases are in very vulnerable settings in many Arab countries. It's not that long ago that in Baghdad, uh, no, it wasn't in Baghdad, excuse me, in Pakistan, in Islamabad, terrorists broke into a Christian church, Catholic church, and shot up people there just because they didn't want them there. There is a lot of ongoing 
conflict in the area of the Middle East. And certainly in some cases, American Jews are uncomfortable with Israel's military ability, but I support it wholeheartedly because they have to defend themselves. They don't live in the best neighborhood. Anyway, I'm gonna be quiet now. What do you guys, anything that I can- Bob, Bob Weston's hand is up. Um, now, where did Messianic Jews come from? Is the Messianic Jews, Jews who believe in Jesus, uh, where did that come from? Okay, um, it's an oxymoron. How's that? Yeah. Um, in the 19, there was an organization in the United States which is similar to an organization in London. The organization in London is called the, the Distribution of the Holy Scriptures to the Jews. It's a missionary organization. In the United States, there was an organization which was the American Board of Missions to the Jews, whose sole goal was to convert Jews to Christianity, which has been fair play for the past 2000 years. The Hunt brothers of Silver Wealth were major funders of this hope. In the 1970s, somebody named Moshe Rosen, if that was his real name or not, created a group called Jews for Jesus, which had a new approach to the conversion of Jews. And that was to try and claim a status which I identified for you two weeks ago, which had to do with those who were followers of Jesus prior to Pauline intervention and the breaking of the connections, which created the historical misnomers of Jewish Christianity which meant that those people who were part of that new group, their origin was of, from Judaism and what became Gentile Christianity, which was after that, which were people who were neither Jews nor Christians and just joined the Christian community as it evolved in the first, second and third centuries. The Jews for Jesus mantra, mantra was Jesus was Jewish. You can, if you're Jewish, you can still believe in Jesus and still be Jewish, which of course is illogical, but nonetheless, this is what has created this oxymoron known as Messianic Jews, who are people dominantly of Christian origin who have adopted Jewish symbolisms claiming that they are living 2000 years ago in a time when there were Jews who were part of the initial core of this new group that celebrated Jesus. They are, to my mind, offensive to Christianity and dominantly to Judaism because their whole purpose is in many ways to confuse people who aren't clear about who and what they are into thinking that you can be both. Just like you can't be a little bit pregnant or are you still beating your wife? There's no way to answer that question appropriately. There really is no reality to the claim that there's such a thing as messianic Jews. Okay, other things. Yeah, we it's one minute to eight. Wendy Hahnemann, Hahnemann, if I'm saying it right, Wendy's hand is up, and then uh, it's it's up to you, Rabbi. So Wendy, you can ask your question. Sure. Um, I never knew about the slaves coming to America that were there. There was such a large Muslim contingent. I I guess I thought of them as, in a way, Aborigine. Aborigines right. that they had their own religion in um, Africa. Did was there any kind of impact? If I mean, if they came as Muslims, did they have an impact on the other slaves that were of? I mean, they definitely were not Christians. So, 
Well, I, I think part of the answer to your question is when you follow through the evolution of that generations, they really became part of their own model of Christianity. So that the Islamic relationship kind of fell to the side. And remember that most Americans, maybe up until today, have had very little understanding, maybe since 9-11, but before that really had no idea of what it all was. I mean, it was all the fantasy of, you know, the Arabian Nights and, uh, you know, uh, other types of sillinesses. I mean, I remember when I was studying the Iranian revolution that <clears throat> for the most part, Americans were so enamored by the Shah and his gorgeous wife and their lifestyle that they were, they didn't know that they were Muslim. They just thought they were these really incredibly cultured people living this very extravagant lifestyle. And even today, you know, here in the United States, we have probably five to seven million Muslims. They are, there are areas, certainly in Michigan, where there are long-standing communities. There certainly are communities here, certainly in South Florida, but they are still a very small minority here in the United States. Um, whether they will grow beyond that, we just don't know. We know that in Europe, one of the frustrations is that because Europe has no birth rate, there is a lot of jobs that have gone unfilled that have created the migration dominantly of Muslims into filling these jobs. And they are resented terribly over the past 30, 40 years, certainly beginning with Germany and the, you know, the way in which they were treated there. The fact that they, and France, you know, you've seen the riots and everything else. We have non-integrating Muslim populations in Europe. Now that may just be because they're first generation, it may change, but it is one of the ongoing geopolitical challenges of the world that we live in today. I'll take another if you want. Or... Right, Jim, Jim, Jim Grant has his hand up and then okay. it's a little after eight. So we'll finish with Mr. Grant. Thank you. All righty. Well, the picture in the background of me, my son spent eight deployments in Iraq as a medical okay. officer. Okay. And this is one of the, uh, uh, this is one of the ziggurats. There are several of these <laughs> in Iraq. And this is the one which has been restored uh, during uh, the reign of Saddam. Uh, I might add, talking about the, uh, the immigrants coming uh, uh, during uh, slavery, I grew up in a plantation town in the South. <clears throat> the name of the church that I <clears throat> attended my entire life, <clears throat> and, excuse me, until I moved away, was named Keith Memorial Methodist Episcopal Church South. Now, <clears throat> the Keiths were the owner of the largest plantation, which covered much of the town. What town was that, church. by the way? Pardon? What was the name of the town? Athens, Tennessee. Okay. Tennessee grew cotton and tobacco. Yep. But anyway, <clears throat> the church, which was built in the 1850s, had a balcony with chain holders for the slave chains. The Keith family, which uh, for which the church was named, brought their slaves to church every Sunday in yep. chains yep. and chained them in the balcony. Now, as a little boy growing up in the church, me and other little boys, we like to sit up in the balcony and play with those uh, chains. Right. The, organ, the organ had an absolutely beautiful pipe organ in it. The way the air was there, remember before electricity, so the air for the organ came from a pump room in which two young black men sat on chairs and pumped Yep. Uh, so you had four feet 
on the pumps uh, to pump the air for the organ. Now that is uh, that is the gospel truth. I don't make that up. Unfortunately, no, unfortunately, that church burned in 1947. My wife grew up in the Presbyterian Church, only three blocks away, and it has it has today the same balcony with the chains in it. But the church has closed that part of the church off, so people are not allowed to go there. One well, other comment I would I would make sure. in uh, regards to the uh, uh, Quran, and of course my background is messing that up. But anyway, the the uh, Quran is divided into thirty major sections. So if you read one section a week in thirty days, you will, uh, or I mean a day. If you read one section a day you will read the entire Quran uh, in a month. It's not a very big book. No. As a matter of fact, the translation that I have only has 640 pages. Right. Well, I really appreciate your bringing that piece to us. And it's very important that we understand that as part of the evolution and reality of American culture, as opposed to just throwing it away. It's important to understand the time that that was done. It was done really because they saw the church as, a, as an important institution, even though we can decry the concept of slavery, they were in many ways trying to save those souls, even mm -hmm. as they use them as a means of production. Mm -hmm. But that became the dominant reality. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I wanna just leave you with two books if you're interested. There's a very good book written by a Muslim named Reza Aslan, A-S-L-A-N, called No God But God. If you're interested in learning more about <clears throat> the evolution of Islam, I recommend the book to you very highly. Mm -hmm. The other book is I'm gonna go back to the Gates book the history of the black church, which deals with the transition from the African passage to the evolution of the churches here. It was the only place where the slave population could actually connect one to the other, when even if they were in chains in the church, they could see someone else's baby, they could speak to someone else's family because they were not really permitted to do that in their daily lives. So thank you everyone. I appreciate you're willing to hear me babble on and on. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night now. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah. oh, I, I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. It was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's really good. Yes. Hi, we... Haven't seen you in a while. Yes, if you're <clears throat> if you're interested, I read just out of curiosity. <clears throat> you can go to the bookstore in the uh, Muslim Center over just beyond uh, St. John's Center, and uh, uh, they sell any number of Korans, uh, and I've read the Korans.